So here we are, uh, turning to our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10, it's page 976. As we continue to move forward in our series, Hell and Heaven, we spent three Sundays on hell, and now we begin today on heaven. I say eight series, an eight-part series, it's probably going to end up being a nine-part. I just figured out one thing I want to add, so it'll, maybe it'll be a nine-part. I want to begin with Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. You will notice the very last statement in verse 10 goes along with the hymn number 111 that we just sang before the offering. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him, in love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the will of the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. And now we turn to the Old Testament, which is where I will spend a considerable amount of time towards the end of the sermon, but it's first, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles 6, beginning at verse 12. If you're using the Blue Bible, it's 362. This is the prayer of consecration and dedication of the temple. And so you'll notice that this whole chapter, which is a huge, long chapter, is all basically wrapped around this prayer of dedication. And as a side note, I want you to pay attention to Solomon's bodily positions as he prays. Never forget, throw your body into your begging and your posture into your praying. You've heard me say it a hundred times, I'll say it again. And you will see an example of it here. Also pay attention to what he says in his prayer. We're just going to do the first part of the prayer. I'll come back to it throughout the rest of the sermon. Second Chronicles, chapter 6, beginning at verse 12. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands. And Solomon had made a bronze platform, five cubits long, five cubits wide, and three cubits high, and had set it in the court, and he stood on it, then he knelt on his knees in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Yahweh, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart, who have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him, and spoke with your mouth and with your mighty hand and fulfilled it this day. Now therefore, O Yahweh, O God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit upon my throne, uh, to sit before me on the throne of Israel, if only your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk in my law as you have walked before me. Now therefore, O Yahweh, God of Israel, let your word be confirmed which you have spoken to your servant David, but... Will God indeed dwell with man on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Yahweh, my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you, that your eyes may be open day and night toward this house, the place where you have promised to set your name that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place and listen to the pleas of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place and listen from heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. O God, high and lifted up, whose dwelling is in unapproachable light. Heaven is your throne and earth is your footstool. Come now and raise our sights and give us durable glimpses of heaven beginning with this sermon and throughout the remainder of this series that we might become so heavenly minded we finally become some earthly good. To your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
For those of you who are visiting, the sermon notes are on the back of the worship guide there, back here somewhere, back on the back here, and there are questions there for you to maybe discuss with the family at lunchtime today. And so just about everyone I know under the sun assumes that they're going to heaven. I mean, that's one of the underlying storylines of that great Disney movie from 1989, All Dogs Go to Heaven, right? You didn't laugh. Come on, I know you've watched that show. I know Bill Ruiz watched it. He watches it almost every week, I'm sure. But, you know, that's kind of the storyline behind that. I mean, there's more to it. But what does heaven mean to them? I mean, if you ask folks, some will say only that it's just a better place. Others, and I've had them say this to me, call it the great golf course in the sky. No, 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 it wasn't John Harris. I promise it wasn't John Harris. The great golf course in the sky, or some call it the great hunting camp in the sky. I mean, that most folks believe in heaven should not surprise us because God, as the writer of Ecclesiastes has told us, God has put eternity into man's heart. I mean, almost every culture and society throughout the millennia have believed in some kind of life after death, whether it's Valhalla or uh, whatever it is. They've always believed in some way. What's sadly humorous to me, that doesn't go together, but it'll have to do. What's sadly humorous to me, though, is that within the 21st century American Christianity, there seems to me to be very little interest in heaven. I mean, you go to any Christian bookstore. Wes and I were just at uh, Mardell's this last Friday. You go to any Christian bookstore, and you will find tons and tons and tons and tons of books on how to make money, how to care for children as good Christians, how to stay married as good Christians, how to speak in tongues, how to have health and wealth and glory here and now, how to find assurance, how to become more certain that you are a child of the king, how to overcome demons and territorial spirits, and so forth. But rarely will you see a book about heaven. There are some out there. Randy Alcorn wrote a great book that I would recommend to you on heaven, and there are others, but they're rare. Therefore, dear friends, this morning we want to answer some questions about heaven, and we will examine, uh, we will examine, therefore, if, um, we're going to answer some questions about heaven, and we will examine if heaven really has any meaning for us today. Sorry. I had something happened in my brain there for a moment. We will therefore address why heaven is neglected, why it matters, and what it means. There's your three points that you see in the sermon notes there. And when we finish this day, you should begin to have some clear answers to these questions with maybe a surprise or three. So why is heaven neglected? Why is the study, the talk of heaven really neglected, the thought of heaven? I think Honestly, to begin with, we humans and Americans and even Christians are just too terribly preoccupied with the here and now, with the present moment. So here's a, this is a little plastic coin, but I thought this would work well. So if I put my plastic coin out there, guess what I get to see? I get to see Dave Frisella and there's Denise Hensley, and I get to see all you people, but I also know this coin is there. But when this coin begins to come closer and closer, what are my eyes? What do you think my eyes are starting to do? Right? Focus on the coin. And now after a while, if I go to one eye, it's hard to see you because I'm busy focusing on this little bitty coin. This little bitty coin becomes all-consuming. Okay? It's something very much like that. The daily realities around us can draw so close that they become all-consuming, but then if you could put them back into perspective, you would realize that um, they're not, maybe not really as big and as important as we think they are. But they come to impinge upon our sight and our perspective. And it's one reason why we don't study very much about heaven, because we're all consumed with these things. Further, my friends, let's be honest. The reason why heaven is not studied very often is that life is sweet. Life is sweet. I'll give you an example. I just got done with a book called A Hobbit, A Wardrobe, and A Great War, where Joseph LeConte is pulling together C.S. Lewis's life in, in the war 
and afterwards and J.R.R. tokens and then what the First World War was like in many ways. And one of the things he points out is that J.R.R. Tolkien, before the First World War, had many very close friends, and they banded together and ended up in the war in 1916, and there they were in the thralls of the First World War. Tolkien was sadly notified that not too far from his position, his very dear friend, G.B. Smith, who had been walking in what should have been a safe zone, was hit by a German shell fragment that just came flying out of nowhere and hit him. But he didn't die from that. He died from the resulting infection of the wound four days later. Now you may say, well, how's that talking about life is good? Brothers and sisters, it was just two or three years after that, antibiotics finally surfaced. We survive infections our great-grandparents didn't usually survive. You get what I'm saying? Can you pick up what I'm putting down? Life is sweet. I go to the hospital and see people, and when they're going through different situations, and I'm amazed because it wasn't too long ago in my lifetime they would not have survived those conditions, and they're now surviving. Thank the Lord for good medicine. Life is sweet on so many different levels. Well, with the sweetness of life, we come become increasingly drugged by the well-being and the prosperity. And so usually it's death or tragedy that shocks us back into reality, reality just temporarily pulling us out of our lethargy, but it doesn't happen long. As the old saying goes, time heals all wounds. And then we're right back to it, the same old routine, the changing of diapers, mowing the lawn, paying bills, arguing with the news, voting, checking our IRA account, whatever. We're right back at it. Next, the reason why we don't often think about heaven or study it is that most folks simply take it for granted that they will move into that stage someday. It's just an, another automatic promotion Right? Another automatic stage of our existence. I mean, we're entitled to heaven because, well, we're entitled. That's how the thinking goes. But also, maybe it's not looked at and studied very often because, well, it just doesn't appeal to us. Sometimes heaven is portrayed as the never-ending church service. Yikes! Right? Sometimes it's portrayed as this perpetual heart playing and wings and white robes flitting from cloud to cloud, and that's it. I mean, when Ann and I could finally afford a honeymoon, and so we flew from Gr Turkey while we were stationed in Turkey and flew over to Greece and spent 10 days in Athens, Greece, back before some of you were... Anyways, so it was a long, long time ago. It was in the 83 or so. And for just fun, we decided to turn on the Greek TV, and we saw... Uh, a comedy show in Greek. I didn't know a lick of Greek. But it was all about heaven, and the main character dies and goes and becomes this angel flitting around from cloud to cloud with his harp and his wings, and he looks grumpy, right? But I've seen in North America that same kind of betrayal. We, it just isn't appealing the way it gets presented. Just not appetizing. But maybe even more the reason why heaven is not well studied or not studied by many is because it's just beyond our comprehension. I mean, Paul puts it kind of simply this way, what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I mean, even sacred scripture only gives us a slender set of images and it's not long as you read through all of that, did you begin to notice that human language falls exhausted on the floor, panting for breath. I mean, imagine that you ended up, and I'm not saying anything about tribes in Papua New Guinea, but let's just use that as an example. Let's say you ended up at a tribe in Papua New Guinea, and they've only been the same 100 families and people in this village of thatched roofs and sticks and still using bows and arrows or whatever, 
And you end up there, and let's just pretend that you overcome the language barrier, and you begin to explain to them Oklahoma City. Try to explain to somebody who's lived in a, with 100 people all their life, and their, gran, and their mom's and dad's life, and their grandparents' life, Oklahoma City, over 600,000 people in the city proper, over 1.5 million people in the larger area. What? And then cars and roads, televisions, radios, airplanes, right? And then try to explain to them the internet. Yikes! Do you get my point? Their limited ability, uh, experience, will limit how much they can even fathom what you're talking about. It's very much the same way as we think about heaven, as we look at Scripture. It begins, you just realize, this is not even scratching the surface, and we have no way of comprehending what all of this is going to look like. So in that reason, we just don't study it very often. And lastly, let us be honest, we are conditioned to neglect heaven. It has no earthly value, we're told. And so in the words of that Johnny Cash song that he sang about the dear old sisters who were so heavenly minded they were no earthly good. Our age tells us to drop that old pie in the sky by and by thing and make money. Feed the impoverished, save the koalas, fight the ozone depletion, and so forth. Much of which is important, don't get me wrong. But they all become like the little coin and when they take over our perception. And so we have often, too often, swallowed the whole can of worms before we know it. And so here are the reasons, or some reasons, why the study and thought and perspective of heaven is neglected, which then brings us to why heaven matters. First off, my friends, why does heaven matter? Because, honestly, many folks who think that heaven is automatically theirs, are gravely mistaken. Just go back and look at our Lord's words that we read before the confession of sin. What does Jesus say? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father is in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Did we go work at the shelter? Didn't we go help out with Project 66? Didn't we vote the right way? Didn't we do all the right things? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. One reason why thinking about it, studying heaven, is because many folks who think that heaven is automatically theirs are gravely mistaken. But next, many of the notions about heaven, and I gave you a few of them earlier, but many of the notions about heaven are gross, gross misrepresentations that need to be corrected. We need to study this so that we have a better sense of what heaven really is. And as we do that, I'm going to tell you, honestly, as you do that, it will be, give you aid in clearing... Um, it will give you aid in... Um, in clearing away the clutter of folk religion and Gnosticism that is infecting our age and our society like a deadly viral contagion. Also, taking the time to understand and communicate what heaven is better, to do it better, will become, can become, one of our more powerful aspects in evangelism. But it can also become one of our more powerful aspects of consolation consoling those who have no hope of justice in this life. Finally, my friends, it's studying it is for our own spiritual growth and effectiveness in Christian service. The truth about heaven is in the Scriptures primarily to comfort us, to shore up our strength in perilous times, to encourage, inspire, and promote holiness, Fill us with joy now and so on. The reality is, dear friends, you are no earthly good until you get heavenly minded. Or as Paul puts it in Colossians 3, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God 
when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We study it because you get so heavenly minded, you can finally become some earthly good. Indeed, my friends, heaven matters, and thinking about it matters. But what do we mean by heaven? Let's talk about what heaven means. And here we're going to look at and specifically draw on 2 Chronicles 6 quite a bit. So if you have your Bibles open, wonderful gold stars for you. If you don't have your Bible open, please open them there to 2 Chronicles chapter 6, 2 Chronicles 6, that passage we read. My friends, we need to chop down some weeds and clear the debris from the lot before we can map out the contours of our house. And that's what we're doing this morning. We're going to chop down the weeds and remove the debris so we can start tracing the outlines of our house. In sacred scripture, heaven can refer to about three things. Here we go. Number one, it can refer to the atmosphere. It can refer to the expanse above our heads where the jet streams are and the clouds and the rain comes from and so forth. Notice in verse 13, and then we're going to drop down to verse 26. Notice that as Solomon knelt, he spread his hands toward heaven, right? Towards the sky. And then notice he says in verse 26, and there's prayer. When, verse 26, when heaven is shut up and there is no rain. So one way that heaven is understood in Scripture is just the atmosphere where, you know, all the stuff happens with jet streams and thunder clouds and all that good stuff, right? So it can be that. Secondly, or further, it can also denote what we often call, or what I used to call, outer space, especially if you ever watch the, the old kids show, the old show, Lost in Space, you know, right? So outer space, the space beyond our atmosphere. Notice what Solomon says in verse 14, O Yahweh, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. When Solomon keeps bringing up heaven and earth, it should draw your minds back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 14, and God put in the heavens the sun, the moon, the stars to govern the season. So heaven can be referring to what we call outer space. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Is everybody okay with this? All right, so the atmosphere, it can be outer space. But lastly, in Scripture, and what you and I most often think of when we talk about heaven, is heaven itself. So let me walk you through 2 Chronicles 6. We're just going to hit verse by verse by verse. I want you to see how Solomon puts this. 2 Chronicles 6, look at verse 21. Notice how he says it. And listen to the pleas of your servants and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place and listen from heaven your dwelling place. Then verse 25, then hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your people Israel. Verse 27, then hear in heaven and forgive the sins of your servants. Then again in verse 30, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and render to each whose heart you know, etc. Then down at verse 33, hear from heaven your dwelling place. Then verse 35, and hear from heaven their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. Verse 39, then hear from heaven your dwelling place, the prayer, their prayer and their pleas and maintain their cause and forgive your people. Notice how... Heaven, beyond the atmosphere and beyond outer space, heaven is the dwelling place of God. Now, when, we, when I say that, there's a problem. Most people think of place meaning longitude and latitude, that there's actually a mailing address. You could, mail a, you could write a little postcard, Dear God in Heaven, and you could send it and the post, postman will know where to put it. But that's not the point. I mean, notice what Solomon himself has said back up in in uh, verse 18, where he says that God cannot be restricted to any singular created space. God will not, will indeed dwell with man, will God in, dwell in, let me try this again. But will God indeed dwell with man on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven, atmosphere and outer space, all created places and regions cannot contain you how much less this house that I have built for you. Notice that, that 
God is beyond a place. That's what I'm going to try to get across. He cannot be contained in a space. And so we hear this in many passages of Scripture. For example, Jeremiah 23, 24, Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill all heaven and earth, declares the Lord? Or Isaiah 66, verse 1, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. I mean, just notice throughout Scripture that actually God's place is far outside of created space. It expands beyond created space. But also in various places in Scripture, glory and heaven are used interchangeably. For example, Psalm 73, verse 24, you guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me to glory. You will receive me to glory. And so here's what I'm trying to get across. When we talk about heaven, so we've got to remember there's, there's in Scripture even, there's the atmosphere that's called heaven at times, then there's outer space that's called heaven, but when we're really talking about heaven, we're talking about the dwelling place of God, and we realize that is beyond created space. Does that make sense? Heaven then, as we're thinking of it, is not localized, not a localized place with an address or coordinates. It is the dwelling place of God that cannot be contained in creation, though it does contain creation. So based on all of this, we must recover the simple and profound truth. God, God is what makes heaven, heaven. Let me say it again. God is what makes heaven, heaven. Unfortunately, when you ask many folks about what they think heaven is, many of their descriptions will be empty of God and empty of His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, Uncle Joe has finally gone to see Aunt Mabel. That's awesome. I mean, I've heard that a thousand times. Where was God in that equation? I'm not saying they didn't think that, but it's not the first thing that comes out of their mouth and not the thing they talk about when they think about heaven. In almost every case, the thought of the centrality of God in Christ is utterly missing from their, their heaven that they have constructed in their brains. I mean, God and Christ have become completely irrelevant to many people. Just listen to how they talk about heaven. In fact, I would venture to say, and I don't mean this unkindly, but I think many folks would be quite happy without God in heaven. And yet, heaven exists for God, and without God, heaven is meaningless. What is the one place where God has abandoned? It's called hell. We can never think of heaven separately from God. But notice in this prayer of Solomon that there seems to be this great distance between heaven and earth. When they pray towards this place, hear from heaven your dwelling place, answer the prayer down here. Seems to be this great distance between heaven and earth. Why is that? Because, dear friends, heaven has been ripped away by sin and Satan. That's what happened in Genesis 3. Heaven has been ripped away by sin and Satan. Listen to a passage you know well. Romans 3.23 All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so I would venture to tell you and to say that the story of Holy Scripture, simply put, this is really simple, okay? But simply put, the story of Holy Scripture is the story of God bringing heaven and earth back together. Heaven finally, once again, coming to feel, fill earth again. It's the story of how God is revealing and restoring, even now, His majestic heaven to earth in His Son, Jesus Christ. 
In the words of the hymn we sang after the confession of sin, number 111, Jesus who died will be satisfied and earth, earth, and heaven will be one. Or to echo the Apostle Paul's words in Ephesians 1 verse 10, God's plan all along has been to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. To unite all things. So the story of the Bible is the story of heaven and earth reconciled in Jesus Christ. So the remedy of Romans 6, for Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death. The remedy for Romans 6.23 is found in our assurance of pardon in Romans 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also ab- obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Or to put it in the words of Matthew Henry in his commentary, it's always good to quote. Four words. Grace is glory begun. Grace is glory begun. And so my friends, three things as I wrap up. First, then, heaven is not located at an address way out there, but it is a place, it is God's dwelling place that may, that may be for some way too close for comfort. Secondly, heaven is God-saturated and Christ-dominated. Lastly, God is, through Jesus Christ, His Son, bringing heaven and earth together. And so if you want heaven, you must reject the hell-oriented way that you may have been trudging down, and you must run to Jesus where God's heaven and earth are being brought together. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, as we jump into the subject beginning today, guide us and lead us. Oh, may we become so reanimated by the thought of unending life with you forever, no longer struggling with our sin, no longer tasting the bittersweet fruit of injustice or immorality, our own or others seeing what has been ripped apart, what has been slaughtered and wounded, restored and healed and refreshed and transformed. Oh Lord, reignite in our hearts the beauty, the joy, the grandeur, the splendor of heaven, your dwelling place. And may we become so heavenly minded we can finally become some earthly good. Thank you that in Jesus, you are bringing together and reconciling heaven and earth. Amen.